Martin. The title of our talk, The Benin Bronzes, Colonial Violence and Cultural Restitution, is at the heart of many museums as they address their role and consider the provenance of their collections. I'm delighted to introduce Dan Hicks, a curator at the Pitt River Museum and a professor of contemporary archaeology at the University of Oxford and thank him for his time. Dan's new book, The Brutish Museum, argues for a dismantling, reimagining and repurposing of our outdated infrastructure of museums as an urgent task if we are to have a world-class cultural museums fit for the 21st century. Are the Benin bronzes just the tip of the iceberg? And are we at a tipping point for change? This will, I'm sure, provoke questions. So I will ask you to wait until the end and you can place those questions in the Q&A at the bottom of the page. I now welcome our speaker, Professor Dan Hicks. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. Thanks so much. I'm just going to hopefully share my screen. Um, so if someone at the appropriate moment after its full screen could just either nod or say that you can see it. Are you able to see that, uh, Juliet? That's, that's, yeah, that's looking good, Dan. Andy, thanks so much. Right, OK, welcome, everyone. Uh, and it's uh, so nice, I think the first thing to say is, even though obviously it's a very international audience, to be actually, actually uh, talking at an event hosted uh, by the Friends of the Pitt Rivers Museum. Um, so it is really interesting to see how the conversation over the book, over the ongoing events, sort of as they unfold, are landing in different ways around the world. But of course, it's also an issue for us because the Pitt Rivers, you know, holds uh, actually uh, one of the more significant of the international collections sort of of these objects. Um, so it's actually it'll be really interesting to see how we talk about this sort of after my talk. So I will talk for about half the time we've got available available for 40 minutes or so, so that we allow um, sort, of, sort of ample time for the, the Q&A. But I just want to start, I guess, with the notion of the decolonial, of the decolonization of our museums, which is something that we hear a lot about at the moment. Um, and sort of actually here in the UK, as really distinct from, let's say, you know, how the word operates in a North American context or in any other sort of context where there is the ongoing existence of sort of 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 colonialism that relates to settlement where so the conversations of this kind happen on stolen land here in the uk we're talking about stolen art rather than stolen land as such so this is about i guess extractive rather than a settler colonialism and that means that the notion of the decolonial, I think we can look at in different ways. So we can look in terms of that word, uh, I think helpfully we can look at it historically. Uh, you know, we can realize it's a concept that hasn't just been made up in the past year or two, but has a deep history in our fields, in anthropology and archeology, span but also in indigenous movements, in African led movements that reach back a long way. Um, so whether we go back to the, the Tuck and Yang observation that uh, decolonization is not a metaphor from only uh, 10 years ago, or we go back further to Audre Lorde's observation that the master's tools um, will not dismantle the master's house, that sense that what we inherit in terms of our institutions in terms of uh, our, our, our intellectual frameworks, our disciplines, that that is not you know, neutral, that it's something that is maybe a part of this issue around empire, around histories of, uh, of ideas over supremacy, ideas over race, that are part of what we're addressing. So we're complicit 
historically in this in our anthropology museums, our archaeology museums, uh, and of course in our universities as well. And that means that we may also want to reach back even further to Fanon and to Fanon's observation in the Wretched of the Earth, for example, that the decolonization sort of process has to involve a decolonization of the mind, that, that sort of modes of thought, that knowledge itself, that the way in which, the, in which we think about knowledge in our universities and obviously you know, beyond has a relationship to empire. So the decolonial process has to make sense on those terms. But I'd also say in terms of Fanon, that we can learn a great deal at this moment in time from from actually from his his essay on a culture and racism whereby he told the story that i think we need to really attend to in the present so much that um so in the 19th century we're aware that natural history and that our natural history museums were actually actually put to work for the fake sort of science of, uh, of uh, racial science. We're aware of the legacy in sort of physical anthropology that skulls were displayed in order to tell the racist lie of sort of different types of human, different species of human. But that sort of racism we learned from Fanon, which he calls vulgar racism, that racism was really quickly accompanied by another kind of racism, which was a cultural racism. This is the notion, of course, that we're aware of in sort of anthropology and museums, um, in archaeology and art history, we're aware of those notions of the fake idea of the primitive or, 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 or indeed of its sort of counterpoint of civilization as a sense, you know, as a word that we might use in, all, in order to seek to distinguish what ought to be in a museum like the Pitt Rivers and what ought not to be. But we haven't yet actually in our institutions like anthropology museums, and I think also in anthropology as a discipline, we haven't yet faced up to what that form of, of really so, sort of the, uh, the uses of culture has meant and continues to actually to mean in the present. So how is it, if we're talking about what Fanon is calling sort of cultural racism, actually rather than uh, vulgar racism, then our institutions of sort of culture and our disciplines that rely on the culture concept as anthropology has done for more than a hundred years, we end up having to accept that issues of race, issues of dispossession, and indeed ideologies around cultural supremacy are not simply sort of in our discipline in the same way as they are in any other field of life. We were in some sense the engines and the tools of those ideologies. And, uh, and of course that means for the decolonial moment in the present that we have really to reckon with essentially cultural whiteness as much as we do simply with anti-racism. So what some are calling the decolonization of our museums, and which I prefer to see as the unfinished work of anti-racism and indeed anti-colonialism, we can use those thinkers. We can also, as I do in the book, we can reach back further to Du Bois and indeed to Aimé Césaire, but also we can foreground actually sort of African-based thinkers, indigenous thinkers from the present as well. And so Ashil Mbembe, for example, and his notion of the necro-political has been incredibly important in my thinking and writing recently. And, and ultimately, I think we have to underline how so much of the most exciting and important thought on the topics that we're looking at here on in terms of the legacies of empire, in terms of sort of what the role of the museum is, how to reimagine museums, that's being led from our colleagues in Africa and from indigenous communities around the world. So what does that mean? Well, that means 
actually fundamentally that this work in our museums is urgent, but it also means that there are great risks. So in the book, I talk about the account, the really important account, which I'd, en I'd encourage everyone here to go and read from Samaya Kasim, that talks about her involvement in a very important exhibition in uh, Birmingham that happened in, in 2017. Um, and her involvement in this show, the, the, which was the, uh, the Past Is Now, it was called, which looked in a single room in the Birmingham uh, Museum and Art Gallery, it looked at the role sort of of empire in terms of the formation of the city of Birmingham, in terms of its history, its art and so on. She was involved as a co-curator, as a community curator. And so what she wrote though, was not about, well, not only about the positive elements of that show, actually, which, which were amazingly important, of course, as well, was actually really a landmark for some of the conversations we're having now, but she also pointed to the great risk, which is that decolonization is something that be that can be be co-opted. It's something that can be very superficial. It's something that can sound really good in the annual report or the press release, but that that actually will not sort of necessarily in those contexts really mean anything. So she warned about the risk of the decolonial turning into part of the UK's national narrative, that sense of it being a curio with no substance, or worse, for it to be, be claimed as a victory, as, a, as an achievement of the British, the railways in the colonies, the two world wars won, and the one World Cup, and now, hey, it's the decolonial sort of moment that again can be celebratory. That's, that's incredibly dangerous, as she points out, and I think reflecting on her words now, we might compare that to what many of us would see as the missed opportunity that happened for the 200 year anniversary of abolition, that was 1807 to 2007, where so many of us had thought in the heritage uh, sector, this was gonna be a really important reckoning with sort of enduring histories of racism that in fact, has led, if anything, to a sense of abolition and emancipation as being things that that were won, sort of, you know, by the British. And also it served, as I argue in the book, it served to hide or to occlude or to take away from this really important uh, period for empire, for extractive empire, as where, you know, yeah, which is really what we're talking about here, that, that runs from the Victorian age onwards. So that sense that, that there's, a, there's a big sort of, sort of Queen Victoria sized gap in our historical consciousness, whereby we think about the UK on the world stage after, after emancipation in 1838, we maybe think about the Crimean War, but really, there's not much until the First World War. Whereas, of course, across the Victorian age, there were wars every year, and these were large operations, and they were against Africa, and they were against Asian communities, and they were across the global south. So that which the book reframes or seeks to reframe as World War Zero is a big part of the, of the context here. So I've been, been curator here at the Pitt Rivers for actually over 14 years now. And I think, I mean, my role, I'm, I think all of us who work in the museum and in other museums like it are, are, are actually really aware of that role that we have, which in some part is to keep things the same. We have to look after things that we inherit from our, our forebears in the discipline, in the, in the institution. So a lot of the work of the curator has a lot in common with the work of the conservator, the work of making sure that the ironwork isn't rusting away and that the moths aren't eating the fabrics. But so many in my position, and indeed so many who work in these institutions, have over the years mistaken their role for one in which 
sort of it is, if you like, to seek to prevent the world from changing around us. So there's been a mission creep that relates to how the curator, how the museum serves to intervene with sort of time to give the illusion that it can, it's able to halt time. That has been something which if we're not careful in a space like the Pitt Rivers means that we're forever trapped in a kind of ideology, a way of thinking, a way of sort of acting that is actually from the late 19th century or, 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 or early part of the last century. So that sort of, I think is an important sort of concept, but it's also important for us if we think sort of theoretically as well, what sort of not only in terms of the displays, but in terms of what the Pitt Rivers means, how do we think about what the museum is and how it operates? And here I think we can never return too often to the, the uh, diagram that Augustus Henry Lane Fox Pitt Rivers, after whom, you know, of course, our institution is named. Uh, that, and so it's an image that he drew in the year that he first put his objects on display to the public, which was in East London in 1871, 1874, sorry. So in 1874, he uh, drew this, sort of account, if you like, of the evolution of the wooden stick, where in the middle there is a hypothetical wooden stick from which in every uh, direction are evolving, are fanning out these weapons, all of which are identifiable objects in the Pitt Rivers collections, and each of which was a weapon from a single society of the time. These were Aboriginal Aust 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 Australian so the weapons which he, of course, purchased at auction and from uh, dealers in London. So these are the sort of weapons that are uh, washing up from empire in the metropole. He had no sense of the relative age of each of these items, but nonetheless, he arranged them according to these hypothetical series. What if, he argues, what if we were to say that material culture were to evolve? What if form is constantly being improved? So this in part, of course, uh, famously is based upon his role in the 1850s in improving the sort of rifle of the English army, uh, and indeed his experience in the Crimean War, where the difference sort of in between a musket or a rifle, that relatively sort of minor difference, sort of in terms of the history of uh, weaponry was so decisive in that issue over whether one empire won or whether an empire fell in between the Russians and the French and the British. So that idea that we can say that the small improvements over time lead to what one might say is an evolution that happens not only in the natural world, as had, had at that time sort of relatively recently been explained by Darwin, but could be applied to the world of culture and to material culture. That was an idea that he put at the heart of the arrangement of, of his museum that of course continues to echo on here at the Pitt Rivers, actually, actually in the present. So, so in some ways, we could say that this is a fairly conventional improvement narrative, you know, Victorian improvement narrative. Um, but I think there are two things that we need to sort of underline about it for our purposes. One is that, of course, it's a theory of weapons. There's a violence sort of written into this. There's a sense there is a militarism at the, at the core uh, moment, the foundational moment, for anthropological material culture studies there. So that's one thing. But I think another thing is that it's a theory of cultural supremacy. OK, so it's a theory that is really bound up with the premise of an anthropology museum that displays the items that were taken from the, the enemies who were defeated in war, as it were. So that 
those forms of violence, though, have sort of sat in the pit rivers for many years unremarked until actually that foundational moment for so many of us that had worked in the museum for so long at that point, which was the Rose Must Fall Oxford movement in 2015, who observed that the Pitt Rivers Museum is one of the most violent spaces in Oxford. So that African-led movement, as it had been sort of worked out at Cape Town, sort of earlier in 2015, as it links back actually to, to, to the long-standing fallism movements that were seen across Africa in Algeria in the 1960s, elsewhere in the 70s and 80s, but resurfaced, you know, actually in South Africa in 2015, that I think is able to tell us a lot. And certainly it's something that we in the institution have sort of learned so much from, which is an African led movement that started to point to all these things that we're talking about, sort of in terms of the relationship between culture and notions of uh, sort of cultural supremacy. So in 2015, let's remember, this was a point in early 2015, it was a point at which students at UCT in the, you know, the heart of the academy, who had been uh, born un actually actually after the end of apartheid in 1994 they were now 18 years old or 19 years old and they were at UCT and they continued to experience institu institutional racism they continued to experience the sort of racisms that were ongoing from apartheid right they're in the present the end of apartheid hadn't ended that and there at the heart of the campus was an image of Cecil Rhodes the the arch imperialists, the, you know, the mass murderer, the sort of diamond miner, the, the, the man who, who had led the, uh, the South Africa company uh, that had caused so much uh, 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 dispossession and death and hurt in South Africa and uh, Zimbabwe. So the removal of that image was not a, um, if you like, some sideshow to the so-called real work of anti-racism, what the grassroots movement did was to point out how art and culture had been put to work in order not simply to celebrate the vision of the world that's implied by Cecil John Rhodes, but to make that vision last and to build it into the heart of the academy in art. So in the fall of 2015, when, of course, those involved sort of in those movements who were funded by the Rhodes uh, Trust and other routes found themselves in Oxford and found that Oxford also has an image of Cecil Rhodes, that led actually really importantly in 2015 to 16 in that academic year to a new reckoning with a series of other ways in which empire and the visions of empire had been made to last in the physical sort of cultural environment of the University of Oxford. So that included, of course, the Codrington Library at All Souls College, actually, which has since been uh, renamed. It was named after a, after a 17th century West Indian slaver. Uh, it, it involves the elephants on you know, what sort of uh, used to be the old East India Institute that are carved sort of into the architecture. It includes Rhodes House, of course, but fundamentally at the heart of that movement was also the Pitt Rivers. And it wasn't the weaponry on the, on the upper gallery that was really the focus of that campaign. It was the looted art such as that, in this case, the court art of uh, Benin. So that, I hope, forms the context or gives you a background to in the first half of the talk of sort of, sort of how if you like the Benin case sort of came came into view we saw it for the first time with a with with a different set of eyes it was it was shown to us by this African-led movement that something as simple as sort of art on display with a label that tells the history of how these items were looted, that can not only be history writing or, his, or history presenting, it can be an act of violence in the present. It can be a, an exhibit that was made in order to hurt, it was made in order to show 
if you like, a set of sort of, sort of unequal relationships that are not simply something we're retrofitting onto the past. They were a central sort of sort of a technique of military campaigning at that time. So I think and in the second half of this talk, what I want to try to convince you of or to underline to you, which I, well, I guess really to tell you that, that I learned, was that the looting of objects was not, again, a side effect of war, but it was a central technique that was used in order to undertake the removal of sovereignty and to undertake the destruction of, of traditional religion that also sought to undertake a permanent or long going sort of cultural dispossession. So this incident we're talking about, the so-called the so -called, uh, punitive expedition, which was such a common framing for these ultra violent attacks that happened in the 1880s and 1890s, the sort of notion that, you know, that this immense sort of military operation was in some ways sort of sort, sort of only a reprisal. It was a justified act because of some supposed slight earlier on that was about a treaty not being followed, or in this case, the sort of deaths of a small number of uh, white men who were seeking to gain access to the Oba in, in a sacred season. Those, those ideas over setting yourself up to say, ah, we're actually justified here, was a central part of this ultraviolence that accompanied not the colony. These are not happening in the crown colonies. They're happening in, this, in the lands of the companies, like the Royal Niger Company, which of course was the West African version of the Rhodes Company in South Africa, the South Africa, Africa Company. But it was also not only corporate models, it was the model of the protectorate. So in fact, the Benin sort of city at this point and the kingdom fell within what the British defined as the Niger Coast Protectorate. So this isn't a colony, it's a, it's a sort of, it's a sort of border zone at the, here at the edge of empire, which is how empires at this point, how the European imperialism that came after the Berlin sort of conference of 1884, where of course the, the sort of continent of Africa famously was uh, divided up in between nations, we talk about the so-called scramble for Africa, which is such a euphemism because of course it sort of makes it sound like this was just a bunch of uh, Europeans who, who were just elbowing each other out of the way on some sort of boy's own or boy scout sort of day out. Whereas of course it hides the sheer hundreds of thousands, millions, maybe uh, tens of millions of Africans who were killed in that 30 year period from 1884 until 1914, which I have recast in the book as World War Zero. But the removal of kings and chiefs who were getting in the way of the corporate interests, which in this case on the Niger River were the interests of the rubber plantations and of sort of palm oil. So this is about sort of the tires on the, the, uh, the bicycles of Oxford Doms who cycled around Oxford in the 1890s. This is about margarine and other products that were made from, uh, from actually from the, uh, the palm oil that was there. And of course, actually the Royal Niger Company over the years turned into what is now, what until recently was a part of sort of Unilever. So this is very much a corporate history. It's a history of capitalism, you know, in terms of the corporate model of empire, which of course we've seen at other points in the British sort of overseas history. We saw it in the 17th century with the Royal Africa Company, the foundational moment for the founding of the transatlantic slave trade. We saw it, you know, infamously with the East India Company and all the violence and looting that this sort of you know, corporate army un undertook. However, now we are, we are sort of coming to terms with how the corporate model re-emerged for colonialism. Actually in the, 70, you know, the 1870s, 1880s, and importantly, how the Royal Niger Company was a very central part of that. So in order to remove the Oba, who at this point was in the way of these, these operations, but was there in a sacred royal landscape where 
he was he was he was a part of of an entirely unbroken line of monarchs that reached back earlier than Elizabeth I that had as part of the religious and royal sort of life of the palace had this immensely sort of impressive sort of range of artistic things that you know that were you know, that were made so this artistic tradition you know and that urban civilization that forms part of a series of, you know, of these urban uh, civilizations that emerged in West Africa, sort of over a thousand years or so, um, those artworks were very much in the taking of those artworks, went hand in hand with the removal of the power of the Ova, and also the physical destruction of the palaces. So as the book argues, when the Hague uh, Convention, the first Hague Convention came in in 1899, so many things it listed were things that the British had, had famously just done here in this incident, in this most iconic and largest of the expeditions that were, however, actually there were lots of, of other instances of them. So this is the most horrific, maybe. It's certainly the most sort of iconic in terms of its relationship to art, but we have to see it as part of a wider set of, of incidents of looting and violence that happened across the continent of Africa at these times. So sort of understanding what these objects are, here at the Pitt Rivers, we have some examples of, I guess, the most famous of the more than uh, 10,000 items that were taken in this attack, which are the more than 1,200 instances of the bronze relief plaques. Here are some from the Pitt Rivers, and of course, we can think of those I guess most famously in terms of the 200 or so that are there at the British Museum, as we see on the left-hand side. But as you will have noticed, those of you that have visited the Pitt Rivers and seen the Benning case, or indeed having a look at the image on the right-hand side, you'll see that a whole range of other forms, other materials were involved as well in terms of what was taken. So these include the famous Oba's heads, as we see in the center into the sort of hole in the top of which these sort of carved ivory tusks were put. So those tusks in the unique iconography that you see there sort of operate really as sort of archives, historical uh, documents of the sort of achievements of each of the Obers over the years. There were also images of sort of horn blowers, leopards, as we see here, made, you know, made out of the bronze. There are the ivory hip ornament masks, I guess the most famous of which are, uh, uh, are some, some of those at the Metropolitan Museum uh, in, in Germany and elsewhere. And you see an example of those at the bottom left-hand side. So here's a rare photograph from 1891 of actually how these objects were installed across what we have to understand as, as a sort of sacred relict landscape in which, it, in which each of the palaces of each of the Obers after their death was abandoned, but allowed to remain the focus for devotional religious activity uh, that, that was about the ongoing presence of the ancestors, where, sort of wherein these altars and these artworks on top of them were, were actually a central part of that power and a central part of uh, religious observance. So when we think about what the British then actually did, we often think about this image on the right hand side, which is in, uh, as you hear here at the Pit Rivers, you know, in the, uh, the photographic collections, the laying out of the loot on the ground with these, these sort of soldiers and administrators uh, sort of making lists. But we don't think as much of this image also from the Pit Rivers collection on the right hand side that shows the willful destruction, the desecration of this religious site that happened at the time. So exactly like the fallism movement, which I mentioned earlier on, we have to underline that restitution itself sort of is not something that someone just thought up last year or in the 1990s or in the 2000s. So restitution, exactly like fallism, is a long-standing African-led movement. And the first items were returned as early as 1938 to Obra uh, the uh, the second. And it, here's a photograph of that happening. So we have to see that, that aim to repair after this immense uh, kind of attack, you know, as an ongoing 
so, so, you know, sort of attempt to sort of undo that attack upon sovereignty, upon traditional religion and upon culture itself. Let's just remember for a moment sort of actually how 1884 was not only the year of the Berlin Congress, and it was not only the year of the founding of the Pitt Rivers Museum, it was also the year of the founding of the modern Nashmolian Museum on its site that we see it on now. So the erection of two museums of, of kind of, if you like, archaeology and arts here at the university in the same year, that, 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 that sort of a division fundamentally uh, being about the, the sort of notion of the West and the rest. But also 1884 was an important year because it was the year something else was invented. It wasn't just the invention of the Pitt Rivers Museum, it was, it was the invention of the Maxim. So the Maxim machine gun, hand in hand with the rocket launchers and the, and the mountain guns, and, and also the barbed wire and the electric lighting, these ultra modern sort of military technologies that accompanied the corporate colonialism of the 1880s and 1890s and led it to new either heights or depths, I guess, of sort of violence, new scales of violence. What that meant was that these sort of weaponries that would find their way with such horror actually onto the soils of Europe in the 20th century were tested in the 1880s and 1890s on African bodies. So it's repair from that that is really has always been at the heart of this. Now, the 100 year anniversary sort of of the 18, you know, of the attack uh, that, that, you know, that happened when that came round in uh, a little under, under 25 years ago. Actually, of course, I mean, that, that, that was an important focus for restitution and the campaign from Nigeria, the campaign within Westminster, as we see here, Bernie Grant, sort of outside the, uh, the Museum of, of uh, Mankind, as was. That was an incredibly important moment for many, but many thought that that campaign had failed. However, I think as we approach the 125th anniversary, which is going to fall in, in the February of next year, we see that that, that long-term you know, African-led campaign at this point is really bearing fruit. And I mean, anyone that has read the papers recently has seen how the restitution process is really uh, beginning now to happen. So I'm not in conclusion actually gonna tell you about all of the words I made up in writing this book. Uh, and so you read the book if you want to sort of find out about those. Um, but I do just put this image up just to make the point that so many of the basic framings, the basic vocabulary of my disciplines of archaeology, of anthropology, of history of art, I found to be completely lacking in terms of how we talk about these events. So, for example, there's no more familiar idiom in my field in terms of how we think about, about objects or write about you know, material culture than the notion of the life history of the object, the, 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 you know, that idea that an object moves from, from A to B and it gets a new context and therefore a new meaning. It's this, this sense of sort of moving objects sort of over time or space that gives them extra meaning, it adds to them. It's an additive account. It's a sort of reception theory account of the object. In these cases, there's nothing being added in the process of looting. This is a process of loss, of, sub, of subtraction. So I use the Sheil and Bembe's sort of rewording, retake, you know, on the Foucauldian notion of the biopolitical, where of course famously Foucault wrote about institutions like hospitals or, or your prisons, where ideas of life you know, were enacted with a politics, so the notion of the biopolitical. Well, for Mbembe, he says, <clears throat> you know, actually in this world where there are displaced people from Africa and the Middle East who lose their lives every year in the Mediterranean, actually because we are maintaining the boundaries of uh, fortress Europe, we need some kind of a vocabulary that can talk about not only the politics of life, but the politics of who dies and who gets to live. So his notion of the necropolitical came out of that. So my notion of the necrographic, the necrographies, rather than the life histories of these objects are what in the book I try to, 
sort of right. So to conclude, I guess I want to tell you two things. The first thing is I want to ask why, how this relates to the wider um, things we learn actually from the enduring civil rights movement of anti-racism as we've seen in North America in the Black Lives Matter sort of movement, for example. And here actually my colleague, uh, Nick Mizof, I find incredibly inspiring with his book, which you can look up online. It has a download you can, that, you, that you can get for free, which he called the appearance of 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 uh, uh, Black Lives Matter, where he makes the very simple but the devastating observation that it was a shift in our visual regimes. It was a shift in sort of how we see that led to, a, if you like, a new sort of politics after the racist murders of Eric Garner and, and Michael Brown. So it was the dash cam footage and cell phone footage that suddenly made those murders, those deaths visible. It meant that anti-black violence that's been happening for centuries all of a sudden could be seen and could be shared. And out of that, there was a new sort of phase sort of in that ongoing uh, civil rights movement. And I would add to that, the words of the Minnesota Attorney General speaking after the verdict that came after the racist murder of uh, George Floyd. So earlier this year, he said, I wouldn't call today's verdict uh, justice because justice implies, uh, implies restoration, your true restoration, but it is accountability and accountability is the first step towards anything we could call your know, justice. So what does that knowledge, that idea of seeing, of, of making visible, of sort of, sort of saying their name, how is that relevant to those of us in museums? Well, I, I argue in the book, you know, and actually the most important book, sort of aspect of the book really is the list of the museums at the end. So I argue that this work of anti-racism, anti-colonialism that's so urgent in our museums actually starts with the very sort of tedious, very ordinary, very boring work of the curator, simply making lists. Where are the Benin objects? So the book asks, how far are you right this minute from a looted Benin bronze, wherever you are in the world? And so that list in the back of the book was a first attempt to uh, gather that information together. So as we've seen that, sort of the, the ongoing uh, Nigerian movement to see things returned is having success. And in the West, you know, in sort of Europe and in North America, I've argued that our jobs really is to share information about what we have and to seek to amplify the voices of those who, who, who were seeking restitution. So that, in, that involves, of course, sort of not only the Benin bronzes, there's a great risk that we think that if we return the Benin bronzes, that solves racism in anthropology, that solves it for our museum forever. But it's a very important sort of starting point. And I think the different atmosphere that we're now seeing was really underlined for me when after Aberdeen announced the return of their Benin bronze earlier this year, the Times editorial, the Times of London said it was the right thing to do. So I'm just going to finish uh, with a video, which is just going to show you sort of, sort of each of the pages of the report that we publish uh, today. So it's incredibly exciting to be, be uh, talking to the friends, actually on a day where we at Oxford and the projects that we're running have been able to start that work and take that work that I described as being important that's a bit like the shining of the light. It's a bit like the taking of the photograph. It's a, it's a bit like, let's see the collections. So many of them, so much of this is about things that aren't even on display, they're in the storeroom. How do we excavate our stores? How do we show what we have? So sort of online, and there'll be a link hopefully in the chat for this, you can read our report, which is a first attempt, you know, actually to list what we estimate are the 145 objects that we know were taken in 1897, 
the, so the 15 objects that we think may have been taken in 1897, but we're not sure, but also a whole host of other objects. And you see these objects now appearing in front of you, each of the objects that we think was taken, the vast range of things that we see in front of us here, making that information available to the public, kind of undertaking the, the, the process of peer review that involves, if you like, a whole host of sort of voices, a whole host of those involved, stakeholders, audiences, sort of partners. Um, we have to learn so much from the process of simply aiming to put this into the public domain. So by saying, here's what we think we have, uh, because we have much more complex collections, actually, than those institutions that just have a single item. So it's, it's actually it's a different set of questions than faced, say, Jesus College Cambridge, who, who had a very sort of well provenanced single item. Here we have some incredibly well provenanced items, but also some where further research is really necessary. And so this is a I think important to underline that this report is not the end sort of of this process. It's very much the start of a set of conversations, of a set of ways of thinking. But it also makes us see those objects, but also, as you'll see in a moment, see the photographs. Let's look hard at the photographs that we hold here at the Pitt Rivers, because they didn't just take art, they also took photographs. And so in the book, I argue that those acts of taking have something in common, that the photograph, if you like, is a sort of durational technology. You, you, yeah, it, it is something that has a period of exposure that makes that image last. And that's, what, that's also something that happened with the violence that we see in the form, forms of art as well. So we're going to finish there on the watercolors that were made by Egerton, who was one of the officers there, and there's an altar that he painted immediately before he, had, he, he, he and his sort of troops actually dismantled it. So that seems like a good sort of moment to end. And I look forward to having a conversation about all of that now. Very much, Dan. I'm just going to check my volume. Thank you, Dan. That was really informative very thought provoking and I'm pleased to say that we have at least nine questions down there now. So I will just press on this and um, well, I've got, I've got the start of the first one. Lovely. Given that many restituted objects, not the cream obviously, will be deposited in vast warehouses in their countries of origin, never to be seen again, do you think there is a way to shift the dialogue to culturally share, to cultural sharing by acknowledging decolonized ownership, but arranging long-term bilateral loans involving cultural significant objects from colonial power cultures? Sure. Okay, thank you so much. That's a really important, important issue. I wonder whether you could sort of uh, turn off your mic while I'm talking. Is that all right? Because Otherwise, we'll get feedback. That's great. So yeah, so I mean, this idea that that it's okay, we don't need to give these items back. We can just loan them back. That that is an idea that that that, that is over. I think in our sector, we're seeing an evolution of ethical practice that's really akin to what we saw in the 1990s. When I'm old enough to remember, you know, actually that the idea of uh, returning ancestral sort of sort of uh, remains from from anthropology museum you know, museums you know, you know to indigenous communities or indeed the return of, of uh, nazi loot to, you know to its rightful owners they were seen as controversial and the same arguments were put at the time oh sort of what if these things are lost and can't be seen what if you give something back and it's sold what if it's destroyed what if whatever happens well sort of actually all of those things are right because if you give something back to someone because it's theirs they can do what they want with it so some of these items are sacred items that that, that actually the decision over whether they should be shown or not does not lie with us it lies with you know, with their rightful owner and certainly in the case of indigenous of indigenous ancestral human remains 
there's no one, I think, in our sector that would argue that you should only give those items back if they if they were to build a museum that is going to display them. So normally in those cases, the items are destroyed because they are rightfully buried and there is some attempt at regaining dignity and respect. So for some of these items we're talking about, actually that distinction we make as, as sort of Europeans sort of naturally in between, an, in between a human remain and a cultural object, that isn't so firm. That isn't such a definite divide when you're talking about items that not only sort of represent the ancestors, they constitute the ancestors. So fundamentally, the Sar Savoir report, when it uh, came out in 2018, introduced a really, really important concept into our field. And, and actually, at that time, I, I was a visiting professor at the Musée du Quai Lee. You know, and there was horror, absolute horror among some of my colleagues sort of about this issue, because what, you know, what they were saying is, well, well, this, this report introduces the, the idea of consent. And so my colleagues were saying, you know, what is this language of sexual violence doing in our museum sector? This has got nothing to do with us. What, what, how on earth can we talk about consent? But of course, consent is at the heart of this because it's about sort of, sort of whether items were taken with consent, which leads us into thinking about other conditions where items were taken not in military expeditions as loot, but other under sort of other sort of situations of, 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 of duress. Or indeed, these are items which are non-fungible, they're inalienable, they're things that can't be given away because they're so much a, a sort of central part of the community. But it's also about consent in the present. So, so all the in terms of the things that you describe about uh so here in europe the displays of african items there's no way that this work is is ever going to end the display of african art it certainly isn't going to end the vast fact well, the, the sort of sort of the absolutely uh, shameful fact that what you describe in terms of art hidden away in storerooms is actually the reality sort of here in europe you know the vast majority of these items are not on display here in Europe. So their, their, their return uh, sort of obviously is a step away from that. But sort of fundamentally, there, there are, I think what we're learning is there are different routes to, uh, that sort of whereby you can achieve restitution. So the physical return of items when that is what is uh, demanded is central. But there are forms of restitution that are able to involve the signing over of ownership. So we don't need to fetishize the physical movement of an object unless actually that is sort of what is wanted you know, by the claimant. So fundamentally, this is about agency. It's about consent. And it's about those of us who, who find ourselves working in the relict remains of imperial institutions not seeking to hold on to control, but allow the curatorial process to, to, you know, to become co-curation in a really sort of meaningful way, whereby we can rebalance these unequal relationships with our African colleagues, you know, and, and, and actually learn from the practices which are emerging in Africa, but also rely on the expertise that we already have whereby we know that restitution is able to be a central part of the practice of our anthropology museums because we've been doing it for years in other circumstances. We simply can't hold on to the idea that we're able to restitute Nazi loot, we're able to restitute indigenous ancestral human remains and indeed sort of cultural objects to sort of native North American communities or First Nations or the Pacific, but we'll never do it for Africa. I mean, that's just, we, we can't hold on to that idea anymore. Thank you. Um, our next question is um, what is being done from a legal perspective to return these artworks? As I'm aware, there are laws where which protect the Benin bronzes held in the British Museum as artifacts owned by the British public and not Benin owned. Looking at this legally, what can we do? Sure, absolutely. Well, of course, I mean, laws are there to be changed. And in the cases of human remains and of Nazi spoliation, 
the yeah you know, the heritage act yeah the national heritage act and and the sub acts that affect the vna and the british museum were changed in fact only two years ago the sunset clause in in relation to the very different historical circumstances of holocaust loot was sort of rescinded so that continues to, that's a permanent change in the law now there so laws can be changed but also i i rather feel that our national institutions are increasingly irrelevant in these conversations. So, I mean, less than 9% of the more than uh, 10,000 items that were taken, you know, are in the British Museum. So 91% of it is outside of the national collections of the UK. We're seeing this reckoning with the British colonial past being led from the Germans with every one of the, fed every one of the federal so institutions in uh, Germany returning what's going to be significantly more in terms of numbers than is held by the British Museum. But also you're seeing individual institutions in America, you, even the Met are returning some items, Smithsonian, you've got the UCLA Fowler Museum, you've got National Museums Ireland, you know, the list goes on and every day it grows. Um, so what's happening, which is really interesting, is that, yeah, there may be some legal pressure and some people have talked about whether there are Nigerian agencies that, that could use the law in order to try to force returns. But actually what's happening is something which is far deeper, which is, the, which is that in each of the more than 160 institutions around the world that hold these items, there is a new set of conversations which involves everyone who works in the museum from front of house, you know, to the conservators, to the education teams, you know, and, and into administration, having a conversation with their stakeholders, with their audiences, with their visitors. So it's a localized conversation and, it, and it's working out in different ways in all these locations. So of course there's an iconic sense with the British Museum that the formerly colonial power has a particular relationship with the formerly colonized power. But we're learning more and more about how the dice is loaded, not least actually via the important book for anyone that reads uh, German, my, and so my colleague, uh, Benedict Savoir, in her new sort of most recent book, which is called Africa's Kampf um seine Kunst, Africa's Struggle for Her Art, she tells the shocking story of how, from the year of Africa in 1960, where of course 19 African nations got independence, right the way on into the 70s and 80s, there were incidents where, the, the sort of politicians and the museum directors sort of across Europe, in London, Berlin, sort of Paris, all got together and compared notes on sort of how they could introduce the legal restrictions that came in in the 60s, but also how, how they could introduce a series of myths, sort of the myth that if you return something, it will be sold or the myth that if you return something, the museum will end up in the middle of a war and the ob objects will be destroyed. Or if you, as we heard earlier, the myth that was repeated a little while ago, uh, that if you return something, it, it's only gonna languish in a store. Actually, all of those things are true about, about institutions here in the UK. As my book shows, there were two museums that held the Benin bronzes that were bombed in the Blitz. So the bronzes were damaged. You could go and see them in Hull and in Liverpool. They are, they are actually yeah, damaged in, in, in war. We shut down, you know, actually the single most important, arguably, collection, the Second Pitt Rivers Museum, was sold off onto the art market in the 60s and 70s. So all these things have happened here in the UK. Um, so hopefully that answers, you know, the, obviously there's a lot there, but, but hopefully that answers the question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that, my next question is, where does Pitt Rivers Museum stand regarding repatriation of Benin and other looted objects? Sure, absolutely. So I don't know, I don't know if we have uh, uh, Lara here in the audience and if she wanted to say something, but, but let me say, I guess, I mean, what I can, and then it may be that Lara is also able to say something if we're able to get or, or to type something in the chat, I don't know. But um, so if anyone is a co-host and is able to add Laura, 
if if anyone if anyone could add yeah, that, I'll, I'll, I'll do that then. Speaker. That'd be great, Andy. But I mean, sort of let me just make the general point that I think the position from which I wrote this book was one in which, I mean, it's my job as an academic in a university museum to seek to understand the meaning of our objects that we look after in the present and in the past. So that, I think there's a very important role for university museums in these conversations. And certainly I'm able to say that my personal view, you know, is that these items really urgently need to, yeah, to be a part of the returns that we've seen in the cases of Aberdeen and Cambridge and elsewhere. But if uh, uh, Lara is able to say something, I shall hand, hand, hand over to her. Hi, Dan. Hi, uh, Juliet. And um, thank you, Dan, for a really great presentation, um, which really you know, sort of gave a whole range of um, aspects of why we need to do this work. And, and, and I think we're all really pleased that the report is now published. And, um, you know, it's been a, a huge amount of work by you and uh, members of your team um, and members of the of, of staff. Um, so on the repatriation and the stands of the Peter Rivers Museum, I think we're, we're very clear on our website also that we are working uh, with the um, partners in Benin, uh, the different you know, sort of um, constituencies that we need to work with to look at um, how we would be able to you know, find pathways forward. Um, we are part of the Benin Dialogue Group since um, 2017, I think we joined um, because we felt that it was a really important development around making sure that we are agreeing across um, different museums that have important collections, um, you know, what the best way is to take it forward. I think it's been a really important process, which took a long, long time, which is sort of is a bit typical of these kind of um, repatriations. Um, but I think what uh, was the most important significant step that we've taken that will enable, you know, we just need to follow the procedures that we've um, laid out, um, which were agreed last summer, um, so July 2020, which are the procedures for return. And if there were a claim to come in from, uh, which, you know, that we'll work on uh, together with our counterparts of the Benin Dialogue Group and in Nigeria, that claim will fall squarely uh, under um, provision 2.2, which is that any objects taken under duress or part of military violence would be eligible for return. And I think it's finding the right ways of, of taking that forward is the process we're, which we're in. The report obviously um, is a really important step in that process because it outlines really clearly what the provenance is and sort of shows for the number of objects that we know very clearly that they were taken um, in uh, as part of a, the military violence that those will fall under that category. There's other objects where we need to do more provenance research. We could do that together with our um, you know, um, Benin Dialogue Group counterparts and American counterparts, and especially also with our Nigerian um, sort of um, counterparts. I think that is where this is opening up um, the process. It's part of opening up the process. Thank you very much, Laura. That's really kind of you to have come in and um, helped answer the question. Um, if I may go on to the next question now, what percentage of the Pitt River's total African collections might actually be in line for restitutional consideration under this type of thinking? And then what about the oceanic collections too? Sure, absolutely. No, it's a really important point. You know, the where will it end sort of issue is a serious one. We need to, you know, we need to answer it. Um, so I think the first thing to say is that the vast majority of items in the collection, and, and actually here, here the, uh, the, the, uh, the Pitt Rivers is really unusual, you know, in that more of the collections are on display here because of our mode of display. We have so much on display sort of crammed into the cases. But even at the Pitt Rivers, the vast majority of these items are hidden away in the stores. We, you know, in, in every museum in the country, we are, and indeed, across uh, Europe and around the world, we're talking about items that have been neglected, that are sitting sometimes in a box that hasn't been opened for 100 years, um, whereby we can't be said to be caring for it now. 
because we don't even know what we've got. I mean, we can't, for most of these museums, we can't even say what we have. The reason that we're able, that I'm able to write this report, you know, about what we have is because of 30 or 40 years of, of actually really important hands-on object-based work by the collections team. You know, so that kind of work has happened in other institutions in a variable way because we have so many of our really important world culture collections are, if you like, orphaned collections. They're in sort of local authority or city sort of institutions, you know, and they don't have have any curatorial expertise. They don't have an anthropology curator or a world culture curator. So whether it's in Ipswich or Birmingham or Liverpool or Bristol or, 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 or Edinburgh or uh, Belfast, there's a whole sort of varying set of sort of resources available. And of course, we've seen the museum sector really suffer for years with all the cuts sort of the, that have happened. So we're not in a good place now, actually, to, you know, to understand it. So part of the question is, well, who should do that work? We want to understand what's in the collections. Should that happen here when we haven't looked at it for a hundred years? Or were there to be a demand that let's say everything from Nigeria should go back to Nigeria, as far as I know, such a demand hasn't been made. But if one imagines that that were the case, well, actually, if we were honest about how much we've looked at, for the past hundred years, then it becomes harder to argue against the fact that such work needs to happen. Maybe it should be led from Nigeria rather than from the former, former colonial power. So we know that many communities, many nations are not interested in objects being returned. So this is very much a demand led thing. It's a case by case approach, um, you know, and I guess, you know, it does also raise issues of sort of what we do with those items where we're never going to know where it's from, because it's just it just says Africa on it. And there's nothing in the form of the object that can help us work out where it's from. Um, so we're not going to run out of objects. I think that's the main thing. This is not about shutting down the Pitt Rivers Museum. We've never needed something like a world culture museum more than we do in the present. So at their best, and the reason I love working in the Pitt Rivers, you know, is that we are institutions which are the public face of anthropology. We, are, we can be spaces where we're able to celebrate the many different ways of living and thinking and feeling and sort of making that happen around the world in different ways. But that's, that, that work is hamstrung, you know, and is hypocritical for as long as we hold on to and display items where their return is demanded, you know, or we hide away in the stores items that would be of great significance, sort of, you know, two communities from which they were, they were taken, were they only to know that they exist. So it's a really important piece of work to start excavating these archives, you know, to open up the stores and they're, they're expensive things to run. We, we are, they, they are costly facilities, you know, to run, but we need, I think, I think nationally, this is about waking up to a phase of our history that we haven't thought about, but the spaces we can do that are these museums and these objects where I just don't think we need to worry that, 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 that we're going to return too much. I think we simply need to adopt a case by case approach. Thank you. Thank you. We're building up our questions. We have another. In the context of repatriation of all looted objects and the recognition of perhaps value of some objects for the storytelling and historical potentials they carry, is there a place for the presentation of contextual information alongside physical facimiles where possible practical? Sure, so, and so yeah, you, yeah, yeah, making copies is something that people have talked about. I, th I think again, there's, there's an issue of consent there. So if you're making a copy of something that someone else is not only property, but, but, but I don't know, I mean, if we're able to say intellectual property, I mean, you know, uh, who owns who owns that form? Who owns that sort of design? I think that there's anything of that kind we need to approach ethically. We need to approach in a dialogue. We need to foreground the agency of the of the people who are you know, for whom these items mean so, so much more than they do uh, 
for the museum curator. Um, but but yeah, and I think also we can we can look at the you know there's there's always a question asked by my sort of Nigerian friends in these sort of conversations, which which is actually why is it that if someone in Oxford or in London wants to see you know African arts, they have to see arts that's five hundred years old or 150 years old, where is contemporary African art in this sort of situation? So actually there is a way for museums to expand the collections of African art by, by commissioning and importantly, actually sort of paying for, you know, artwork that is sold in the present while addressing that which was looted or stolen or taken under duress in the past. So, so, and so this is simply, I can't imagine any other walk of life where we would be arguing that stolen goods should not be returned uh, sort of when, when asked. But it is importantly a demand led. This is not about sending back, it's about the giving back of items when asked. So it is simply, I think the moment we come to, if you like in the museum sector is that we simply can't anymore say, sort of never, you know, in terms of items from the African continent, when returns are so normal in all of these, these, these other parts of the world. Thank you. Which would be the proper solution on decolonizing UK museums? Rewriting the plots, returning some of the material culture, or what would you suggest to respond to the popular request of the impact that the displaying of this material cause? Sure. So, I mean, I have to say something about the sort of, because that's the second question that, that is in the sort of, the, you know, the general retain and explain space. And I think anyone that wants to know the, uh, uh, the power or actually more accurately, the sheer limitations of explain and retain simply needs to pop down to High Street in Oxford to look, you know, to look at the silly little sign that's erected under Cecil Rhodes, which essentially is a third monument to Rhodes. So sort of writing, and it, it, it says it's a you know, contextualization, you know, Rhodes was this or that kind of a man, but essentially it's another, it's another monument to him. It's another memory of someone where we need to ask, is that something we, that we want to, I mean, so what we choose to remember is a really important part of what sort of heritage organizations are all about. It's an important part of our historic built environment outdoors, but it's also important indoors. So the idea that we just put a sign up next to the Benin bronzes that say that they were looted, that actually the wheels fall off that one really fast because those signs have existed since the day they were, that they were put up. So right the way from 1890, I mean, within weeks, you know, of the attack, the bronzes were being displayed in Berlin, in London and Oxford. And the story of the defeat of the Ober was there, you know, as a text. It's, it's here in Oxford. And, and in the book, I actually recount the way in which the same story is repeated from St. Petersburg to San Francisco and from Abu Dhabi to Paris and to Berlin and around the world. Why is it that if... You, you know, if you want to be a universal museum, that if you want to be a world culture museum, you have to tell the story of the defeat of the Ober by the British in 1897. So we have to accept that that, that sort of no matter how, uh, how you tell it, the telling of that history is always sort of actually going to be a reinscription of the violence. That's what that because we that's what the museum was built for. So that can become very different once the physical dismantling of the white infrastructure, of the infrastructure of cultural supremacy, that these things were part of is being undertaken. So I'm very hopeful for label writing, as we've seen in the Pitt Rivers, with the removal of, of, of sort of human remains that were put on display actually to tell the lie that there is such a reality as a headhunter society, and it's a cross-culturally sort of realistic thing that we saw in the case of the treatment of the dead enemies, the replacement of the excellent text there that's in its place, that's text that can be part of a process of healing, of truth telling, of reconciliation, and of allowing our cultural institutions to keep in step with our times. But 
simply to leave the loot on display and to rewrite the label is not what I'm interested in doing. You know, if that's not part of a, a wider restitution sort of process. So it's not enough to say who writes the label, how do we think about it? Absolutely, labels matter. But in this context, but, but so rewriting a label is not in itself, you know, a means towards the work of cultural restitution. Thank you. Forgive me if I don't say this right. You mentioned the work of Samara Kasim and the cautioning of decolonization by certain institutions being superficial and co-opted. What do you think about some origin communities, indigenous communities championing a mindset of indigenize instead of decolonize? Sure, okay, so that's a really interesting question. And I think that, yeah, let me turn it around a little bit and say what I think there's another risk here that, that isn't only the, you know, the risk that's under, underlined importantly by Samaya, which is that there's a co-option of the notion of the decolonial. Let's think hard about the context of North America or, 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 or other settler sort of colonies. Uh, let's think about the context of the Pacific and of North America, where actually we, you know, as institutions have had no problem mapping onto those regions, you, you know, you know our, our willingness to see ancestral returns. So to indigenize, you know, absolutely makes sense in terms of the practices where indigeneity, you know, is of course historically part of, it's a resistance to, you know, the settler. But extractive colonialism comes with a whole host of other challenges. There is a risk then, I would say, of the, of the indigenization of African cultural restitution on a North American model. Okay, so we're not talking about, you know, in, this, these, are, these are not in the context of the settler colony. They're not in historical circumstances where indigeneity has emerged as a, as a form of sort of resistance. So the notion of how you return something when ideologies of race and of and of suit and, and of sort of your cultural supremacy were involved not so much with the land as with the body, with objects as well, that leads to a whole host. I mean, we we do allow Afri we have to allow, you know, those important voices from across the continent of Africa who are such experts on restitution. They need to be who who we need to listen to you know, in the case of African cultural restitution, while absolutely, you know, indigenize as a move, as a, as a movement should be supported when we're dealing with indigenous communities. Thank you. You mentioned how new technology, oh, I can't speak. You mentioned how new technology like the mobile phone helps shine the light on BLM issues. Do technology, does technology, can it be used to shift the way we look at the ownership of these artifacts? Could new technologies in art, like NFTs, be used to change the way we look at the return of these items? Sure, it's a really important point. And I'm involved in the legal sort of case at the moment that maybe helps answer that, which is uh, uh, Lanier versus Harvard. So anyone that doesn't know about this case, I'd really encourage you to sort of look it up. There's quite a good piece in the Washington Post about a week and a half ago. So I wrote a legal uh, testimony for the case of, of Tamara Lanier, which is backed by a whole, whole host of, I'm only one voice among so many other sort of voices who've, who've uh, written as a part of this sort of trial. Uh, so Tamara Lanier is the descendant of two enslaved African Americans who were photographed in 1850 in the American South. Uh, and those photographs were sort of uh, taken on behalf of an anthropologist based at Harvard, who then sort of filed them into what would later become the, the Harvard sort of Peabody Museum. So, uh, so, so Tamara's arguing 
that these daguerreotypes, it's a very early type of a photograph, which isn't exactly a photograph, uh, you, you know, they are not the, uh, the, the, you know, they're not Harvard's, they belong to the, the, the uh, descendant. So it's a question over restitution and over property in relation to the photographic. So in the submission I wrote with uh, uh, my colleague Nick Mizoff, we make the point that the daguerreotype operates rather like an NFT. So fungibility, which is at the heart of what an NFT is and isn't, relates, of course, also to the ownership of human beings. So if an NFT is non-fungible, then arguably so is ancestral material culture. So I definitely think that some of the thinking that's going on and where I was very inspired here actually by learning about an artwork uh, by an artist called Dred Scott in New York, whereby he launched, he made an NFT and, and auctioned it. And the NFT was a, uh, an artwork which he called the sale of a white man. He, he sold a white man on, on the, uh, the corner of a street in New York. So what's going on there is it's a work that intervenes with the notion of fungibility, the notion of inalienability in relation to humanity and objects. That's at the heart of all of this debate. If we're good anthropologists, we have to acknowledge that the boundaries between human beings and objects you, you, uh, you know, have a cultural variety to them, but they also have an, have, have an ethics to them. So there are good reasons why sacred objects should not be sort of bought and sold, and also good objects why they shouldn't be on display in our sort of cultural economy of the museum, where, of course, as so many Nigerian uh, colleagues are very happy to point out, the display of the Benin uh, bronzes is something which from which we we actively profit. It's at the heart of the business model that we just that these objects are on display. So I hope that goes some way to answering how I think what NFTs uh, raise for us in our bit of the sector is how we navigate what can and can't be sold, what is fungible and non-fungible, which relates also to things that are in you know, you know, that are alienable or, or, or inalienable. So when the French culture minister, after the return of the objects, uh, actually a bit earlier this year, so after the sort of the decision to return the objects had been made in the French case, when she said that the Benin example does not call into question the fundamental principle in France, that objects in the national museums are, are inalienable, they can never be taken away from the French nation. That completely misses the fact that these were inalienable for so many of the cultures and nations from which they were taken in the first place. So alienability, inalienability cuts both ways. So might fungibility as well. Thank you, thank you. Is there any sense in which the people of Benin would like some of the looted items to remain in their current places? so that they themselves can be involved in explaining their original significance in Benin? Yes, absolutely. I think the demands insofar as I have seen them relate to a return of ownership and relate to the support for the new Edo Museum, which is uh, uh, designed by Sir David Ajay. I haven't seen, you know, any demands that no object from from Edo states, from Nigeria, should should ever be on display in sort of Europe or North America. That's a that's a position that nobody holds that I have heard in this conversation. You know, it's about the fact that there should be a choice about what sacred and royal objects are on display that's in the hands of the people, you know, to whom the the the, the sort of rights of ownership sort of lie. So I don't think this is not the scaremongers come in all sorts of forms and I think the one scaremongering that's really just you know out there now it's a uh, ship has has sailed is the idea that if you return what in our case of, of course at the pit rivers let's say that we return the sort of 145 objects that's 145 objects out of 300,000 objects and 300,000 photographs 
you know, and who says that we can't add also to the collections in sort of legal ways as well. So, to, and so this isn't the end of sort of ever displaying objects from around the world in the Pitt Rivers. You know, uh, I certainly, you know, I'm hoping that we'll, you know, that we'll be able in the coming sort of months and years to start to purchase some contemporary Nigerian art for the museum in the long run. So it's about evolving our purpose. It's about making an anthropology museum that's fit for our times. Um, our next participant that has offered a question is actually already asked us a question and he's following it up with, um, he obviously, we misunderstood him in some way and he says, sorry for the confusion. His sentence says, I mean, loaning European paintings and objects as exchange. So. Sure, yeah, again, I, had to, I think, I mean, loans happen all the time in between institutions, you know, loans to African, you know, institutions, institutions around the world happen for Europe. And of course, loans happen or can happen in the opposite uh, direction. So loans is great, but yeah, that isn't what we're talking about here, I guess. We're talking about returning stolen goods. Uh, so loans often can be a bit of a red herring where people, and it's even more, I think, the government spin doctors this week with all these issues over loaning, you know, Agamemnon while loaning back the Parthenon marbles. I mean, it seeks to muddy the waters. We always need to watch out for, and I think we are succeeding this time round. Now we're having, you know, in our generation, we're having a debate that was had actually, you know, as the book argues, it was had 25 years ago. It led to the stopgap that was the declaration of the universal value of uh, museums. I don't think any of us think that the universal value of uh, museums statements stands up in this day and age. The idea that if, an, you know, if a Nigerian wants to see their art, you know, from their culture, they just have to have to get on an aeroplane and go and see it in New York or Boston or 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 in London. That that already was a very unlikely idea because of the changing sort of vision of visa regimes that Africans have faced in recent years. And I think after COVID, it's even more unlikely. If we see our lockdowns and, and our medical emergencies not simply as a dress rehearsal for environmental change, but as the beginning of a phase in which people are not going to travel actually at the same rate that they used to internationally, then there has to be an argument for the local consumption of culture that's not even on display in New York or London. It's sort of hidden, hidden away in a box somewhere that no one can get to. So yeah, I think that that hopefully, I mean, as I say, loans is a, you know, loans is a distraction. Let's keep on message and let's sort of recognize that we're talking about a case by case basis. So where the extremists are in this conversation are those people hanging on to the idea that you can never return a stolen object to a, a, an, an African claimant, whereas you can in these other instances where restitution is already part of our normal work. That is untenable, and that's where things are falling apart, really. Thank you. Um, what are some of the main consistencies, discrepancies in the ways in which European North America museums have documented the looting of these objects? Does that make sense? Did I I'm not sure it did. No, sorry. Could you run it by me again? Right, I'm going to say that again. What are some of the main consistencies, discrepancies in the ways in which European North American museums have, maybe he's missed out the word in, in documenting the looting of these objects? Sure, okay, yeah, and so that's a really important question. Uh, as I've said, I think a lot of it is about sheer underinvestment and uh, neglect because there isn't resource. Um, so the that I mean, let's just I mean, I really mean that thing. Think about how far you are right, ne you know, right now from a looted African object and sort of in the UK, it really can be a you know, real surprise how near those items are, but they're not even really well known sort of you know, within that institution, because over the generations, the institutional knowledge has sort of disappeared. 
So the last great archaeological sites we've got left are our museums. They're full of colonial violence, but they're also full of things we don't understand that we really should understand. If we're going to care for something, we have to understand it. But also restitution is about as sort of one of the projects that, that I'm involved in at the moment says, you know, it's also about the restitution of knowledge. So it's the restitution of you know, of objects and of culture, but we have to know what was taken. We have to understand part of what was destroyed was knowledge and cultural knowledge. Um, so there's a great variety of forms of knowledge in our museums and different ways in which loot is described. Um, so it isn't, but it isn't, as I've said earlier, this isn't answered by the sort of you know, v &A approach, as it were, that says we, have to retain these objects so we're able to tell these awful stories about how horrible the British were. That's not what, that's not on. That's just centering ourselves yet again. I mean, the sheer hubris of that, that argument that says that we, we need these objects in order to tell our own history, you know. Uh, so yeah, I think, so, so that would be one approach of how looting is sort of documented, which would be an almost, self-flagellating while oddly celebrating yourself for being so honest approach so this isn't about good and evil this isn't this isn't about trying to judge the past as right or wrong it's about ethical curation in the present so there's no book i think in our field that has dated as fast as you know the book that's called The History of the World in 100 Objects by Neil McGregor, which already is only 10 years old, and they've been uh, repeating it here in the UK on the radio recently. And it's so cringy because kind of already at the time, it was so out of step. This model of the British male white curator who has all the answers and all they need to do is to sort of use an object as a hook to tell you a history that they kind of already knew anyway. You know, that voice of authority is dead. I mean, it's over. Even at the time it already was. We don't curate, we co-curate. So our work, and certainly my work, you know, as a cis male white curator at an elite institution, a central part of my work has to be to undermine myself. You know, if it isn't hurting in some ways, then we really risk simply repeating and reenacting some of these things for which our institutions were put to work were co-opted in the past so that that undermining that work as i as i put it in the book the 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 excavation and the demolition of some parts of the infrastructure of white supremacy for which arts and culture have been sort of put to work is so central and that has to has to be about the co-curatorial it's so hard for us to think that art and culture could be anything but but good, because all of us love museums and we love art. But that was the trick. That's why it's so hard to pull down a statue, because people think it, it's only a statue. It's a work of art. But of course, that's why. If this didn't matter, then in that period of white supremacy being at the heart of anthropology in the 1880s, into the 1920s, the sort of the proto-fascist period where the Germans and the British and the Americans were coming together thinking about cultural supremacy, they wouldn't have put all this effort into erecting images of the Confederacy generals, they wouldn't have put all this effort into putting Edward Colston up or to looting all these objects and sort of putting them in museums if it weren't that they knew that if you put your worldview into art and culture, it's very difficult to dismantle. So that's what we're living through now, but you know, time's up. And I wonder whether time's up for us as well, because we have been talking for quite a long time. Well, Dan, if you are still able to talk, um, we do have a few more questions. Um, I have um, one, two, three, I've got four. You think you can cope or would you like sure. me to? Sure. So I'll take two more if uh, uh, you just pick. And apologies to people that, that can't answer their question. But it's years. been an hour and 40 minutes already. So I do. I, I, I'm, I'm only human. <laughs> OK, how do we how do we prevent the institutional messaging of repatriation from becoming commoditized? Am I saying that right? And used in commercial activities? 
how do we ensure it remains an, an action of mobilizing and directing discourse in a productive way? Wow, that's a really interesting question. I'm, I'm not sure I've got an answer to that, but I'd love to know more about what the context for asking the question is, because I think it's a really, it's a really interesting way of framing it. But, you know, what does commoditization look like? It probably has some relation to the art market. So we probably need to join the dots a bit more between the corporate nature of the violence, you know, of, of kind of looting, and then the way the art market in the 20th century picks up that violence. And again, for corporate interests, continues it. But I do also think, yeah, you know, the, the sense of the contemporary art market for contemporary African art, artists and uh, contemporary indigenous artists, that's central. I mean, let's remember that here in the UK, you know, actually we have a trustee of the British Museum. I'm pretty sure in, I'm right in saying that he is the only trustee who is an artist as well, who used his wreath lectures in 2014 to make the case that Aboriginal artists could never be contemporary artists because, well, because what? Because they're in the past, because they're not, you know, because of, of ethnicity, because of what? I mean, what, how can that be, how can Aboriginal art be kept out of the contemporary art? What, what boundary work, what border work is going on? So in the book, I, I, I say that um, uh, the motto of the book that was in my head all the time I was writing it ran some, some sort of ran like this. It said that as the border is to the nation state, so the museum is to empire. We know from, from, from border studies, from refugees studies, we learn that border work, as the academics call it, happens at all sorts of locations that isn't on the physical border of a country. You know, it happens when you have to show your passports if you want to work as an employer. It happens in our educational institutions and so on. So too for museums, the border work, because the border and the museum are both uh, Victorian technologies for making uh, distinctions in between different types of person. They're about saying that this person is different from that. And so what we learn, I think, in the museums is that there's an ongoing risk that that border work, which of course here in Oxford, the Ashmolean and the Bit Rivers, you know, they're two different kinds of archaeology. Someone once said to me in the context of, of the Ashmolean that I do the wrong kinds of archaeology. You know, what are these kinds of archaeology that we're talking about, these distinctions of art? Um, so that reminds us this is about the decolonization of knowledge so yeah that you know, to bring it back to the corporate question i'm not sure but always always aim to follow the money i think and that 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 sort of normally helps you work you know, work out the politics thank you dan um the question i'm going to, to take is a combination because it's from the same person um he first asks he or she not sure what kind of world museum do you think that we need to build in this age? Um, but he also says, what do you think 2022 looks like for the Benin bronzes and what do you hope for 2030? So maybe it could be a kind of question of a museum in relation to the Benin bronzes as we go through the years. Sure, sure, absolutely. Well, it's uh, uh, nice to end on a positive note and I think, that actually the things that are being asked about there are incredibly positive. I don't think, I mean, those of my generation, we've never had a more optimistic and positive moment for the Anthropology Museum, I think, in our lifetimes. Um, you know, at the events in sort of Paris last week, or, or the week before last, rather, um, you know, you know, yeah, my dear colleague, uh, Benedict, made the point to the assembled you know, dignitaries um, that this is like, that the return of, of the objects to Benin um, was like the falling of the Berlin Wall, in that the Berlin Wall, for those of us, of, again, of my generation, um, uh, there was a before and an after. You know, you think about, if you think, think about Europe, we can all think about yeah, Europe uh, before sort of 1989 and after. 
So it's the same for restitution. It's incredibly hopeful. Um, you know, for 2022, I very much I'm I'm watching with sheer admiration at the skill and the diplomacy of those who are involved in the Legacy Restoration Trust, which is the consortium that brings together each of the African sort of interests in the, the Nigerian interests, sort of in the question of the return of the Benin Bronzes, um, that they are one by one managing to see actually these returns happen and the building of the museum and what the museum means as a project, how it evolves is incredibly exciting. I mean, in, it, in each of these different locations, Dakar, the, the Benin City equivalents, in sort of Ghana, in South Africa, in Egypt, in uh, Kenya and elsewhere on the continent of Africa, the notion of what a museum is and what a, you know, what a museum sort of can be you know, is being reinvented. It's being kind of radicalized. We are learning from our African colleagues in terms of that, in how, you know, everything, all the aspiration we could have for a museum that, that isn't stuck, that isn't static, that isn't where objects sort of go to die, that is a space where we can care for people more than we care for things, that's alive, that's for creativity. So the return of the Benin Bronzes in, in that instance, I would predict, will of course lead to this incredible sort of cultural catalyst for Edo State, because so many of these items are important, not just for people who want to see them in a museum, they're important for fashion designers, they're important for writers and for tech, and for, of course, you know, traditional religion and for a whole host of other reasons. So I think that, and then the final thing to say is that I hope that we will then, and I, th I think that we are now seeing the beginning of this conversation widening out from simply the Benin Bronzes. We're having the conversations that we were challenged to have by Sar Savoir, which are about, you know, those other cases of how objects were taken. How do we address them? How do we think about archaeological collections? How do we think about anthropological collecting? How do we think about things even that were purchased that maybe could never be purchased? So again, it has to be a case by case approach. But those ethical considerations are only going to grow. And I think we will be learning that this isn't simply about returning the Benin Bronzes. It's about a whole host of other histories. Here in the UK, understanding those histories is so important, you know, in, you know, you know acknowledging what happened in Africa, but also acknowledging how it was intimately bound up with forms of cultural supremacy which are present in our institutions uh, 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 today. So in the paperback, in the, uh, the, in the sort of preface to the paperback edition of the book that just came out a couple of weeks ago, I reflect on the past year and what it's been like in terms of these conversations. And I, I guess I learned in writing that, that so much of the pushback that I've had uh, personally, so much of which has come incredibly uh, near to home, from my discipline, from my colleagues, I mean, yeah, not here in Oxford, but 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 in my you know, disciplinary colleagues, you know those people with whom I've worked in the past, the pushback comes incredibly near to home, and that really is because I mean, what are, sort of what are you, you, what is it that's upsetting people? Well, if you're talking about sort of cultural whiteness and how to dismantle it, then yeah, for some people you are, if that's how race you know, the fake idea of race is being defined, then, then yeah, on those terms, I am being a race traitor. I am being happy to allow this vision of supremacy to really start, you know, to be sort of questioned by others. And I'm happy to go along with that and to support it. That puts a lot of people in a lot of, you know, really sort of you know, difficult positions. It makes people think that you're attacking anthropology, you're attacking museums, which of, which of course is the last thing I'm doing and that anyone is doing in the space. So, so the hopeful end is to say that learning from our audiences, our stakeholders, our African colleagues, I think as a sector, we're in the process of um, uh, making and kind of rebuilding anthropology museums that are fit for the 21st century. Thank you, Dan.